struggle with social anxiety? If so, you can't miss this month's book therapy pick. It's a must read for you. My name is Diana Garcia. I'm a licensed mental health counselor in Florida, owner of a private practice called Nurturing Minds Counseling. If you're new around here, my monthly book therapy series is where I pick one self-help mental health book to read, review, recommend, and at least pick up three highlights in case you can't ever pick up the book. All right, let's jump into this month's pick. So let's jump in. This month's pick is How to Be Yourself by Dr. Ellen Hendrickson. Uh, Dr. Hendrickson is a clinical psychologist. Um, you can see the book was published in 2018. I cannot recommend this book highly enough. I really enjoyed so much from this book. Um, from someone who has moments of struggling with social anxiety, working with clients who struggle with social anxiety, this is kind of now my go-to recommendation for someone who has social anxiety. Maybe you don't, but maybe someone you love has social anxiety. I'd encourage you to pick up this book. Or even if you don't say, let's say you meet criteria for social anxiety, but you do have moments when you feel anxious in social situations, she still has so many great tips. So I'd encourage you to pick it up. So as you can see from the summary, the book is broken down into five parts. I'm not going to go through each one, but generally she goes through and explains like, you know, starts to talk about what social anxiety is. She even has a skill in there for you to kind of do a self-assessment. She goes through maybe some of the origins or reasons why certain people develop social anxiety, including kind of some biological factors, the huge part of how um, you were raised and kind of the learning element and how really social anxiety is learned or anxiety in general is learned and it can really be unlearned. And and then really part three to five, it's also talking about then how do you actually overcome social anxiety, right? Because that's the biggest thing. Once you understand it, maybe you can really recognize with it, which I think with her examples and case studies, she does a really great job of making it feel really relatable. But the key part is then, okay, now that you accept that or acknowledge that, how do you actually shift or change your relationship with social anxiety? And she has so many tips in here. Okay, so just off the bat, I wanted to start with the definition of social anxiety, uh, not as part of the insights, but just to really make sure you understand what it is. So ultimately, it's this fear of being judged or scrutinized in a social situation and found lacking. Um, also performance-based, so if you have to give public speeches or anything like that that also falls under the category of social anxiety like a subcategory a specifier but ultimately uh, since you're afraid of being judged or scrutinized and found lacking um, you're afraid that something about you this big reveal is going to be found out and it's going to mean that you're less than and then you do all these efforts to avoid that right so whether that means you avoid social situations outright or maybe it means you go to social situations but then you're on your phone or you kind of just go to the kitchen or you just like stay with your safe people and you don't venture out right it can look very different the type of avoidance that you do but ultimately it's just this fear of being judged and scrutinized really dictates how you show up in these social social settings. And a lot of times it means that you miss out on opportunities for social connections. And it's really big, maybe misconception is not that you don't care about social connections, right? Or maybe other people think that it's actually that you care so much that you really want to foster these types of connections. But again, you're afraid of being judged um, or criticize, and so you, that, that feels really uncomfortable. This is insight one, it's the reveal is that we're afraid in these situations that others are gonna find out these things about us, right? These things that we feel are uncomfortable or lacking or less than. She breaks it down into kind of four categories that you might be struggle, that you might worry about someone finding out about you. So generally, if you're concerned that others are gonna notice that you're anxious, right? So that the physical signs of anxiety are gonna to start to show up and give you away, right? Because again, when we are anxious, that fight or flight response kicks in, which means that some of us will have physical symptoms of anxiety, right? So sweating, uh, trembling, blushing. And so the first kind of fear reveal, if you fall into this category, is that someone's gonna know that you're anxious by these physical signs. The second one is your appearance, right? So you're concerned that there's something uh, physically about you that's less than, right? That are unacceptable, right? And so this also might show up in like spending excessive amount of time and trying to figure out what's where, your appearance, getting it just right, you know, your attire, your makeup, if uh, your hair, whatever that looks like is that you spend a lot of time trying to maybe perfect it in order to really, again, make sure that no one knows or sees this physical attribute of yourself. Maybe you're someone that wears hoodies to try to cover your kind of body or physical appearance, right? So that's the other concern when it comes to the reveal. The third one is our character. So just kind of this overall sense that something about your entire personality is lacking, right? So maybe you think you're not smart enough or you're not cool enough or you're too boring, right? Again, depending on 
what the consonant is, like what you're really afraid of and it, where it shows up, you'll have a sense of what it looks like, right? So maybe um, maybe professionally, when it comes to social anxiety, you kind of get concerned, not so much that you're not cool enough, maybe you're more concerned that you're not smart enough, right? But whereas maybe with some of your friends, maybe you don't have social anxiety, right? Maybe in other social instances, it's more about feeling really boring or that you have nothing interesting to say. So again, it really depends on the setting, but overall kind of acknowledging that something about your character is less than. And then this last one is your social skills, right? So you're afraid, um, not necessarily that there's something wrong about a specific personality trait, but that you have like no personality or that you're gonna be really awkward or that you don't know what to say or how to handle it. Like it's gonna be apparent that you're kind of fumbling. So whatever that looks like, it's just an overall sense that uh, your social skills are lacking. Comments below, do you resonate with any of these categories for the big reveal, the one, two, three, or four? So type one, two, three, or four, maybe it's more than one. Typically you might find that one is more kind of consistent and persistent throughout different scenarios. And it might be helpful to think about what are the situations that trigger your social anxiety so then you'll have a better sense of which one it is. So again, let me know in the comments, one, two, three, or four, which one really resonates with you? Insight number two, uh, this is a little bit more of an actual kind of, okay, how do you do with the anxiety once you're aware of it, right? Once you've accepted it, once you can really relate, okay, I really do struggle with social anxiety. The first part before you ask yourself these magic questions um, is really to get specific, right? So she talks about that anxiety can be really vague, right? So you're worried that someone's going to say something about you at the party. Okay, get really, really specific. Are you worried about someone specifically saying something or are you worried about what specifically they'll say, right? And what that thought really is. Are you worried that they're going to, again, make a comment about your clothing or that you're boring, right? Like really get clear on like what your anxiety is telling you, like what's really scary in that, situ in that situation versus like this really vague, unclear sense of what you're afraid of. Once you have that really clear sense of like, okay, this is the thing that I'm afraid of. So I'm afraid someone's going to say, um, you uh, look horrible in that dress, right? Like, gosh, I can't believe you wore that. Okay, then you would start to ask yourself these three questions to really start to help you figure out how you would deal with it. So the first one, it's really like, well, how bad would that really be? Right. And again, she talks about it doesn't mean that it won't be uncomfortable or won't hurt. Right. And so if someone made that comment, like you look horrible in that dress. Well, how bad would that really be? Right. I mean, yeah, it would be painful, but would that be the end of the world? And I know that might sound invalidating, but really, you know, your anxiety tells you sometimes that things are going to be really bad. But when it actually happens, if they happen, right, because a lot of times the things we're afraid of don't always happen or at all, right? It's that, okay, if that were to happen, how bad would that really be? I also love how she talks about, you know, in those instances where we're afraid of someone making a comment or judging us, it's like also thinking back like, well, but who's really at fault here? You or that person, right? Like, would you ever make a comment to someone about that, right? Or if someone said that to your friend, like you wouldn't think your friend was at fault. You'd think, gosh, this person's like a jerk. Like, why would they say that? Right. So again, just to help you kind of really reframe that, like they're usually the one in the wrong if they're saying something that's so off base like that. The second question are, what are the odds? Right. Again, and getting really clear because your anxiety can make you think that this is so likely to happen. But really getting clear, like, what are the odds? Like, what are the odds that someone would make that comment? Gosh, that dress is so off base. Right. Like, really think about it. Like social etiquette, most people wouldn't say that. So getting clear. And again, I'm just using that as an example, but apply these questions to any example that you kind of really struggle with. And then the third one is like, okay, if that were to happen, right? So like, again, maybe the odds are low, but again, we can't predict the future. We don't know. If that were to happen, how could you cope, right? So really preparing yourself for like, okay, if someone made that comment to you, how could you cope? Maybe, maybe you don't, you know, politely say like, you know, that wasn't nice. Or, you know, depending on the situation, you decide to excuse yourself. Um, take a moment and like, you know, go to the bathroom, put some water in your face, text a friend uh, for support, right? So whatever it is, it's just getting really clear on like, what would you do in that moment if that were to happen? How could you cope? How could you get through that difficult time? And not to say that it means all your anxiety is just going to go to zero, right? Once you do that, but it's going to go down to a place where it's a little bit more manageable, right? And even if you have a sense of knowing like, okay, I could cope with this, right? It's going to put you in a better situation. So again, these three questions, once you've gotten really specific, 
are helpful for you once you're thinking about tackling your social anxiety in a specific situation. All right, my third insight, which again has a couple of different parts to it, but it's the myths of social anxiety. So she busts these common social anxiety myths. I'm just going to briefly go over them. But again, if you're interested, really pick up the book. Uh, the first one, I must always monitor myself and my anxiety, right? So really, this isn't true in anything. It's actually not helpful, right? If your anxiety tells you, even going back to this reveal, like the physical part of anxiety, right? If you're blushing or you're uh, trembling, whatever the case is, it's like if you're constantly trying to monitor that, it's just going to hike up your anxiety and really acknowledging that you don't have that much control. Like you don't have control that you blush, right? For the most part, like there's nothing you could do. Just stop blushing. If so, then you would have done that already, right? So then this fear of like constantly being hyper aware and like checking in and constantly monitoring your performance. If anything, it's so counterintuitive. It's just going to make your anxiety go up and your ability to be present and engage in that moment reduce, right? So she really starts to bust that myth and figuring out like, okay, what do you need to do in that moment to shift your attention and focus to being back in the moment versus getting so stuck on like self-monitoring, right? So that's the first myth that she bust. A second one is how I feel is how I look, right? So this perception that if you're nervous or anxious inside, that other people are gonna know or gonna be able to tell. So she references this study, which I think is really cool, where she has this person, um, I believe who struggles with social anxiety, give this speech or talk to someone, and then they're recording it, and they ask this individual, okay, I want you to tell me a moment where you felt like you were really, you were doing really well, you felt really comfortable, no one could tell you were nervous, and they kind of did a snapshot of that picture. Now I want you to tell me an instance in this video when you felt really nervous, and you felt like, gosh, you were really dropping it, and others could tell, and they did a snapshot. And they compare it side by side, there's like hardly any differences, right? So really uh, busting this myth that clearly how you feel is how you look. It's not true. The third one is that you have to perform perfectly, right? So she talks a little bit about perfectionism. And if you want more information on perfectionism, I'd encourage you to check out this video next. But in general, she talks about how this, you know, expectation to perform perfectly is just setting yourself up for failure because there's no way you're going to perform perfectly, nor do you have to perform perfectly. Like who says you have to perform perfectly? I'm sure you've been in social situations where someone does a blunder and oh, well, too bad. Like keep it moving, right? It's not really a big deal as much as your mind says it's going to be a big deal. The fourth one is I have lousy social skills. So she really talks about that this isn't true, especially for someone who struggles with social anxiety. A lot of times you are super aware of social skills and that's part of the reason that at times maybe you uh, struggle a little bit because you can pick up on these slight nuances, right? So if someone has an expression or says something or their tone is different, since you're so aware of it and you can pick up on these cues, um, you know kind of what are appropriate social skills or not. You just get really stuck in your head when your anxiety takes over and you feel like you don't know, like you're fumbling and you don't know what to do. But it's actually not true. Most of the time you do have, you know, great or adequate social skills, but your mind says that you don't. The last one is I need alcohol to feel comfortable. And she goes through and gives different kind of subcategories, which I thought were really, you know, appropriate. But she talks about how alcohol or liquid courage can become a crutch in social situations and then of course it can work in the short term but in the long term it's really kind of removing your ability to know that you can handle social situations without any type of crutch and of course that over time that could lead to an alcohol dependence right and so really acknowledging that that if you're starting to use alcohol that relationship with alcohol alcohol could become problematic Right. So again, really, she goes into more information for each of the myths. There's a chapter for each one. So I want you to tell me which of these myths did you buy into? One, two, three, four, five, or all of them. Right. So let me know in the comments, right, which were the myths that you really bought into. And now that you think about it, if they're not true, what would that mean? Right. So let me know in the comments below. This was just a super brief. There was so much information from this book. So again, I really, I can't recommend this book highly enough. Like I said, I'm already recommending it to my clients. Um, so if you are interested, I would encourage you to pick up the book. There's links um, on the comments for the author's websites as well as where you can get the book. And as always, I encourage you to continue nurturing your mind, body, and soul, whatever that looks like for you. And if you do pick up the book, let me know your thoughts because I love to hear if you decide to read this, what really resonated with you. Um, so again, that I can continue to recommend this and highlight what are the things that were really helpful for most people. All right, guys, I hope you have a good one.